So Tether Smiley, so you have this, you really have a relationship with words and, and books uh, with 20 years in the business. And um, as I was kind of going back and researching and uh, reading about that, you were born in 1964. And 1964 was a really major year for words and the journey of black folk. Um, it was the year that they kind of languaged into legislation black people's humanity with the Civil Rights Act. It was the year that um, a man who uses words in the most revolutionary way, Dr. Martin Luther King, was the youngest to get the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the year that uh, Dick Gregory's autobiography came out. And that was really like the soundtrack to the pain of black America. So that I wondered for you as a kid, what books meant and what words meant for you? Mm. Um, it's a powerful question. I must say honestly, the first book that I was exposed to, in part because I grew up in a Pentecostal church, uh, and for those who don't think about that tradition, you know that I was in church seven days a week. <laughs> uh, Monday night at seven o'clock prayer meeting, Tuesday night, seven o'clock adult choir rehearsal, Wednesday night, seven o'clock Bible study, Thursday night, seven o'clock, missionaries meeting, Friday night, 7 o'clock, young people's meeting, Saturday morning prayer at 9 a.m., young adult choir rehearsal at 10 a.m., Sunday morning, 9.45 Sunday school, 11.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship, 5.30 p.m. children's church, 7 p.m. Sunday night, uh, evening worship, back Monday night. I did that for 18 years of my life. If anybody ought to make it in. Uh, seven days a week I was in church. So it's a long way of saying, that the book that I first came to read, of course, was the Bible. Um, it is the book to, to, my, to, to this day, Esther, that, that most sustains me, um, the Bible. And it was um, the experience of learning uh, to love to read the Bible that turned me on to reading in the first place, quite frankly. I think that's true for a lot of black folk, given uh, our Christian upbringing, that we get turned on to reading by those wonderful stories in the Bible. And it wasn't just it wasn't just that I was reading the Bible for the sake of reading it, uh, because I was reading it long before I came to believe it. I was reading it long before it became real for me. But I love the storytelling in the Bible. Can I just say for all the books ever written, it's hard to find a text where the stories are more empowering, more uplifting, more inspiring. Oh, are you serious? David and Goliath? Are you serious? Daniel and the lion's den? My Lord, the stories of Paul and his affliction, Old Testament, New Testament, these stories were so powerful for me as a child growing up in this Pentecostal church. And that, long story short, opened up the doors to other books that have changed my life. The Fire Next Time, Baldwin, changed my life. Invisible Man, I'm a black kid growing up in a poor black family. Ten kids, my mom, my dad, my grandmother, 13 of us living in a three-bedroom trailer. If anybody felt invisible in this all-white community that I was raised in, it was me. I understood the rage. Uh, and so Invisible Man was a, was a book that, that came to life for me at an early age. And I had to seek these books out. This was not stuff being taught in my white school district. So I had to, thanks to the black folk in my church, seek these books out. Years later, of course, uh, James Washington's classic text, uh, A Testament of Hope, uh, which, which is an anthology of the best of Dr. King's work, who I regard um, as the greatest American this country has ever produced. And not because he's here in the audience today and not because he's my dear and abiding friend and not because he's the nation's leading public intellectual and the big brother that I never had, but because he wrote a book that literally changed my life and the lives of millions of other Americans. When Cornell West wrote Race Matters, it changed my prism, uh, changed my worldview uh, about race matters in this country. So those are just some of the books, and there are many others, of course, but those are just some of the books that, uh, that have just impacted me tremendously. So I just want to say, obviously, this is a, a conversation, so we're going to have a Q&A segment. So if you have questions, you need to write them on cards that are being handed around. And um, I think Miss, lovely Miss Lachelle over here, we have some volunteers who are going to gather your cards, and then we'll get through as many questions as we can um, at the end. Uh, so you mentioned James Baldwin. I'm a Baldwin babe all day, all day. Magic and mayhem on the page. That's what Mr. Baldwin does. Um, it's March. It's International Women's History Month. And uh, we saw there Wangari Matai, wonderful um, Kenyan writer. Her memoir um, unbowed a beautiful, beautiful story of um, Kenya and really the political turmoil of Kenya, Kenya through her family's personal story. Um, we got the diaspora with Edwige Dondekat, a Haitian-American author, another beautiful writer. And of course, it's the 70th, 75th anniversary of the Eyes Were, watch, were Watching God, Zora Neale Hurston. 
So, um, and we saw Isabel Wilkerson there, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the great uh, migration. So when it comes to the ladies and the writing, what um, women writers do you kind of turn to where their books kind of do what I call trouble the waters? Like they make you think, they stimulate, they challenge. Yeah. Um, there were two, and there are two that we all know. Um, actually, more than two, but let me just, see, now you asked me, I want to give you all of them. Um, let me just highlight four right quick uh, that impacted my life early on. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story about each. Um, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, of course, the first to win the Pulitzer Prize, the poetry, the African American woman. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, her work, her poetry, uh, moved me so much as a child. I was able to grasp it. It wasn't so deep, uh, some of her stuff, that I couldn't understand it even as a child. Um, uh, but that poem, We Be Cool, Lord, I mean, I, I, I remember learning that as a child, and it stuck with me. And I remember the first time I met Gwendolyn. I recited that whole thing for her. I know she must have thought, this Negro is crazy. <laughs> um, but she came, we became friends, and I was honored to be involved in her homegoing service years later, and came on my TV and radio show any number of times. It was a joyous occasion uh, that I had to spend time with Gwendolyn um, Brooks after reading and uh, studying her work and memorizing her work uh, years earlier. It was a joy for me. Um, secondly, Toni Morrison, um, I met when I was a student at Indiana University. And Again, it's too long a story to tell, and I don't want to, I don't want to fill up up the year. Um, but I, I was so anxious, and I, I remember this like it was yesterday. I was so anxious to ask Toni Morrison a question when she came to a lecture in Indiana University. I was so anxious to ask her a question, and it seems that all the good questions were being asked. Uh, and I, it's, it's one of the rare times in my life where I was acknowledged that he's asking a very silly question. And the question was so silly that I had deliberately forgotten what the question was. But I just wanted to be in dialogue with Tony Morrison. It's kind of how I feel like talking to Cornell West every day. I'm, I'm always saying something silly, but I just want to be in dialogue with this brother. Um, but Tony Morrison, I, and I stood up and I asked a real silly question, but she handled it in such a way um, and talked to me afterward. Uh, and again, I won't go into all the, into all the details, but I remembered that the way she handled me asking a very silly adolescent question. Uh, and I've had many experiences on my television show over the years where people have said really stupid things, where they've said things that were factually incorrect, where they've said things that were terribly embarrassing. I was talking to an African-American author one day who is a major television talk show host now, who shall remain nameless, um, who happens to be a black woman. Uh, but in the context of this conversation, um, she said to me, she had a chapter in one of her books about race, and she said, she writes, wrote in one of the chapters, Esther, how do I know, no, she said, she was writing about the fact that she hated being called an African-American. Her argument was, this ridiculous argument, I'm not an African-American, I'm just an American. So she was trying to distinguish, I don't want to be an African-American, I'm just an American. And so we got into a, when I read the book, we got into a deep conversation on the TV show. And at one point in the conversation, she said to me, how do I know I'm even from Africa. And I wanted to say, girl, look in this mirror right here. Um, she said, how do I even know I'm from Africa? I could be, so she said live, and this, this is for PBS. This is live on BET now. We'll give the right context. To this. We're live on BET, and she says to me, how do I know that I'm from Africa? I could be from Egypt. She said this on national television. And all I could hear in the back of my head was Toni Morrison uh, and remember how she treated me in that moment when I said something really silly. And I turned to the camera and I said, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back after this commercial break. <laughs> I, I, I could have pounced because I didn't like her argument to begin with. I could have pounced, but I didn't need to pounce because the humiliation, the embarrassment. I saw her, her handlers were over in the corner, Esther, and I saw them all go, Oh, and I just let it be. But I remember how Toni Morrison treated me when I said something silly and I chose not to pounce. And so it wasn't just her writing that got to me as a, as a uh, I'm a male obviously, but I loved Sula. I loved, uh, I loved uh, uh, some of her earlier stuff. And I, and I was turned on by how, by how Toni Morrison really didn't get started until she was 39. She's 39, almost 40 years old when she really gets started. And I was always, you know, reminded that even at that early age, 
because I grew up in a poor family, and I was wondering when my moment was going to come and whether I would have time to actually make a contribution. And if Toni Morrison didn't get started until she was 39 or 40, there was time for me. 